Here in the lab, we obviously have some pretty incredible organs to show you, like this one here, the human brain. This is the command center for pretty much everything you do. It's calling the shots for your thoughts, your movements, and even your ability to process all the anatomical awesomeness from your viewing of Institute of Human Anatomy videos. But what happens when something goes wrong with the brain, like during a stroke? A stroke is one of the leading causes of death and disability worldwide, and it can hit fast, sometimes with no warning. So today, we're diving into the anatomy of a stroke, as we're gonna show you exactly what's happening in the brain, why it's so dangerous, and how it's treated. And most importantly, what you can do to lower your risk. I'm Jonathan Benyon with the Institute of Human Anatomy, and it's time to get into this anatomical awesomeness. First, let's define a stroke. A stroke occurs when blood flow to part of the brain is disrupted, starving brain cells of oxygen and nutrients. Without oxygen, brain cells start dying within minutes, like four to six minutes. And that's why strokes are medical emergencies. And there are two main types of strokes, ischemic strokes, where a blood vessel gets blocked, and hemorrhagic strokes, where a blood vessel bursts, causing bleeding in or around the brain. Hemorrhagic strokes are less common, about 15% of cases, but they're often more severe. And since ischemic strokes are the majority, we're gonna zoom in on those first, but we'll circle back to hemorrhagic strokes a little bit later on. To understand an ischemic stroke, let's start with the brain's blood supply. Here's an incredible cadaver dissection, and you're zoomed into the right side of the neck here. And if I reflect this muscle out of the way called the sternocleidomastoid, you can see the carotid arteries. Here we have the common carotid artery, and this is what you'll feel when like you're trying to feel a pulse on your neck but the common carotid artery will branch into an external carotid artery and an internal carotid artery. The external carotid artery supplies the face with blood, but the internal carotid artery will go into the skull, and this is the major pipeline that delivers blood to the brain. And it will branch into smaller vessels like the middle cerebral artery, which we'll talk about in just a second. But inside the brain, these vessels will eventually become tiny capillaries, feeding oxygen to billions of neurons. During an ischemic stroke, something blocks one of these vessels, cutting off the blood flow, and the most common culprit, a blood clot. Either a thrombus, which forms right in the brain's arteries, or an embolus, which travels from somewhere else, like the heart. Imagine a highway, your blood vessel in this example, blocked by a massive traffic jam, stopping most blood and oxygen flow. The brain tissue in the core of the blockage dies quickly, within minutes, but surrounding this core is the ischemic penumbra, where blood flow is reduced, but not completely gone, like a slow moving lane. This tissue is at risk, struggling to function, but it can still be saved if blood flow is restored within hours, typically four and a half to six hours, but sometimes even up to 24. And this is why we don't just give up if someone doesn't get to the ER in four to six minutes. We still have this salvageable brain tissue, the ischemic penumbra. And the faster we can restore full blood flow to the penumbra, the more we can reduce long-term disability. And as a side note, how many of you tried to say penumbra while watching this? If you haven't, go ahead, because it's kind of fun to say. But the middle cerebral artery, which is a branch of the internal carotid artery, is the most commonly blocked artery during an ischemic stroke. And this artery supplies large areas of the cerebral cortex that are responsible for motor function, sensation, and language. And so this explains some of the common stroke symptoms that you may have heard about, such as weakness or paralysis on one side of the body, trouble speaking, diminished sensation, and loss of vision. But there are other arteries that could be potentially blocked and cause other or additional symptoms. And a skilled clinician who has a good understanding of neuroanatomy and knows which arteries supply specific parts of the brain could actually get a pretty good idea of which artery is blocked just based on symptoms but imaging is definitely going to be done in the hospital to confirm the exact location. You know, with the pace that medical technology is moving these days, it's kind of mind blowing. We're seeing innovations that would have sounded like sci-fi just a decade ago. Take strokes, for example, something that affects nearly 800,000 people every year in the US alone. The conversation around recovery and neurotechnology has never been more important or more fascinating. Like, have you ever heard of this story? A stroke survivor speaks again with the help of an experimental brain computer implant. One source highlights how this implant is giving a woman her voice back after 18 years of silence, while another dives into the AI powering the tech. As someone who's passionate about health and science, I love that I can read diverse perspectives all in one place to get insights on this new groundbreaking technology. 
This is all thanks to Ground News, which is an app and website that pulls sources from around the world so you can get more context on the news that you read. For this story, you can see over 250 sources are covering this breakthrough. In the world of health, it's crucial staying informed with accurate information. Misleading medical news spreads like wildfire, creating confusion and false hope. That's why I'm proud to partner with Ground News. They help you cut through the noise and verify the credibility of every source, especially when it comes to science reporting. Think of it as an anatomical dissection of the news. Precise, thorough, and built for people who want to understand, not just react. Here you can see that 98% of the outlets covering this story are rated high to very high for reliability, which is super reassuring when we're talking about breakthroughs that could impact people's lives. Plus, Ground News has a dedicated health and science page, so you can stay up to date on the latest developments in stroke recovery, medical tech, and beyond. So if you're interested, go to Ground News and subscribe by scanning the QR code on screen or head to ground.news slash human to get 40% off the Vantage plan, which gives you unlimited access for just $5 a month. That link is also in the description below. And now, let's get back to strokes. So what causes the blood clots that lead to a stroke? Well, a major culprit is atherosclerosis, which is plaque buildup in arteries, like the carotid or cerebral arteries in this case. Plaque made of cholesterol, fat, and calcium narrows the vessels, creating turbulent blood flow. But this plaque can rupture, which then triggers the formation of clots. You could kind of think of plaque as rust building up inside a pipe, narrowing it and making water flow unevenly. If that rust breaks free, it can cause debris to clump, blocking the pipe or the artery entirely. And there are definitely some things that we can do to reduce our risk of plaque buildup that we're gonna discuss a little bit later on. But I do need to mention the clot that forms somewhere else and travels to the brain. And remember, this traveling clot was called an embolus. But let's say someone has irregular heart rhythms like atrial fibrillation, where the heart's upper chambers quiver instead of pumping properly. This allows blood to pool in the chamber and stagnant pooling blood will start to form clots. And so a clot could break loose from the atrium and travel to the brain. And as an FYI, this is why some people with AFib take blood thinners in order to help prevent strokes. But how do you know if someone's having a stroke? Well, we have definitely illustrated that time is critical. So we use the acronym FAST. F stands for face, and so you'd wanna ask them to smile and see if one side is drooping. A is for arms, can they raise both arms up or is one drifting down? S is for speech, ask them to repeat a simple phrase. Is their speech slurred or is it strange? And T is for time. If you see any of these, call 911 immediately. Other symptoms might include sudden confusion, dizziness, or even severe headache. And again, the faster one acts, the better the chance to save as much brain tissue as possible. So how is an ischemic stroke treated, at least during the acute phase? Well, it's probably not going to surprise you that the goal is to restore blood flow as soon as possible. One treatment is a clot-busting drug called tissue plasminogen activator, which can dissolve the clot if given within three to four and a half hours of symptom onset. But timing is obviously tight and not everyone is eligible for this type of treatment. And it can also increase bleeding risk. So this is definitely not something that is going to be given with a hemorrhagic stroke. Another option is a mechanical thrombectomy, where a surgeon threads a catheter through an artery, often from the groin, to physically remove the clot. And in some cases, this can work up to 24 hours after symptoms start. And it's pretty incredible that we have this kind of technology to complete a procedure like this, like literally threading through something through the arteries to bust up a clot. It's pretty remarkable. Now, let's touch on hemorrhagic strokes real quick. Instead of a blockage, these happen when a blood vessel bursts, leaking blood into the brain or surrounding tissues. This can be caused by high blood pressure, aneurysms, or even head trauma. The bleeding compresses brain tissue, causing damage, and it's tougher to treat, often requiring surgery to stop the bleed. While they are less common, they're also more likely to be fatal. So controlling something like high blood pressure is key to prevention. And so let's continue down this road of prevention and discussing what you can do to reduce your risk of having a stroke. Again, you wanna keep your blood pressure in check. Aim for getting below 120 over 80. So if we're talking both numbers. You want below 120 and below 80. High blood pressure is the number one risk factor for both stroke types because it can weaken the arteries, which can lead to bulges in the arteries called aneurysms, and then these could burst leading to a hemorrhagic stroke, and it can also lead to plaque formation leading to an ischemic stroke. Obviously, eating a healthy diet is always something that we talk about with cardiovascular health, 
because this can help to control cholesterol and reduce the risk of plaque formation. And of course, exercise is wonderful for cardiovascular health. I love showing my students the elasticity of this aorta because I use it to discuss that when arteries are nice and compliant, meaning they stretch and recoil, this recoiling helps push the blood further downstream, making it easier on the heart and even reduces blood pressure. And exercise can help maintain healthy, compliant, stretchy arteries and also reduce your risk of plaque formation. If you smoke, it would be ideal to quit because it's a massive risk factor for clot formation. And manage your blood glucose levels because those with elevated blood glucose or blood sugar levels or even diabetes, that excess blood glucose can irritate the inside lining of the blood vessels, making it more likely for, here it comes again, plaque formation.